to talk about Dingin, which is a, a feature that um, we'll be with a bunch of people on adding to JavaScript and web platforms. There's big in, you can have integers as, as big as you want. So, first question is why? We already have numbers. Numbers in JavaScript are, are double precision floating point numbers. And those, that can already represent a lot of different things. For example, every integer up to uh, 53 bits can be accurately represented in numbers. But that's not, that's not really enough for everything that programmers work into, even if it works for, for most things. Uh, for example, if you have an operating system interface, you might want to represent iNode numbers. This is not for the web platform, but for, for Node.js comes up. Uh, but I want to represent the number of microseconds since the Unix epoch. If you have a monotonic timer, if you're representing milliseconds, you can do that in 53 bits, but this uh, exceeds that. And it, it's proposed for, for example, for a new date API for JavaScript to represent the time this way. Uh, numbers which can be even bigger than 64-bit than range that you might want to represent are Things like hashes or, or checksums when you're calculating them or passing them around. Uh, <coughs> there are use cases for FFIs to other languages with larger integer types. For example, in the web platform, we have WebAssembly. And WebAssembly uh, has 64 bit integers as a basic data type. And there's just no way to map these to numbers. You could, you could map them to numbers, but you would lose data. So the current WebAssembly design is that. If you export a function which has 64-bit integers as, a, as an argument of return value, it will throw an exception and you call the function, which is not, not that great. Uh, there's also the, the WebAssembly heap has 64-bit values on it. And you can generally read or write elements of the heap unless they're, they're that big. Uh, could be used as a, as a basis for implementing a decimal data type, for example, to to store money values. Uh, there's also lots of binary data formats that come up with 64-bit integers in them. This comes up in, in network protocols or file system formats. <clears throat> and if you're solving a project or other problem, it's much easier if you have begins as a, as a basic data type. Uh, but which one of these would make sense in JavaScript? Do we want to have Oh wait, uh, I was going to talk about the next slide. So, what would make sense to add in JavaScript uh, given what we have already? So one thing that we have in JavaScript is that if you have a number one, just a single number one, this is a number. So most languages that have both an integer type and a floating point type distinguish between one and 1.0, where they say that one is an integer and 1.0 is a float. But in JavaScript, we already have both of them be floats. And it's already too late. There's already plenty of code on the web, which will be 1 divided by 2, and expect the answer to be 0.5. I don't think we can change that at this point. Uh, the new syntax, the proposed syntax, is to use 1n when you're defining, when you're, when you're expressing a big int literal. What do you do when you have mixed, uh, mixed arguments? This is another sad case about the history of JavaScript. In other, in other languages, uh, if you just you know plus one to something, that would be a natural way to get a number that's one greater than it. Uh, also in other programming languages, whenever you do a mixed operation between, uh, between integers and floats, it promotes to a float. But for JavaScript, this doesn't seem like a very good design. Because, uh, because we have this history of so many things being numbers, and because the only value to big ints is that they give more precision, the design here is to throw a type error when you have these mixed type operations, so as to not lose precision, so as to, to not uh, encourage programmers to, to write bugs. Because if you were okay with it being a, a number, why, did you, why were you even using an integer in the first place? There are other cases where this comes up. Really, the entire uh, JavaScript ecosystem is entirely built on numbers, because that's the only type there is. And if we if we allow them to be mixed, it will inevitably lead to more of these cases of losing precision. So the resolution is to throw type errors all over the place. Whenever you convert 
a big int to a number, unless you do it explicitly through the number constructor, it will throw a tanker. Another, another sad thing, normally you would call a type like this a big num, but we can't use that either because number means double. So we're calling it a big int. Uh, all these things were the, were the results of, of lots of debate and uh, I'll get into the debating strategy a little bit later. So one of the, one of the core topics was, should we add begin or 864? Uh, you might have noticed that most of those use cases that I represented earlier would have been satisfied by an 64 type. Uh, and there are some arguments for N64. In fact, the community seemed to favor N64 over begin, uh, which was surprising to me. So most, you know, most of the use cases do fit in this range. And programmers tend to assume, JavaScript programmers tend to assume that if we made an N64 feature, then it would be faster than begin. They tend to assume that most of the overhead comes from uh, you know, having it be generalized to big ends. However, uh, the current proposal provides general big ends for, for a few reasons. So one is that in real programs, in languages like C, where you have, <coughs> where you have integer types that are wrapping around, I, at least for me personally, if I write code that overflows, it's, it's a bug. I don't think I've encountered cases where I want that code that overflows. I know it comes up sometimes, uh, but usually it's just, okay, which integer type should I choose so that it never overflows? And that's the logic you have to think of. So it doesn't seem like a feature, it just seems sort of like a compromise if it were to get this performance. I think for this reason that overflowing typically is a bug, high level programming languages tend to support uh, you know, like Python tend to support large integer types rather than rather than having an overflowing integer type. So if we if we didn't do big int, if we did size restricted integer types, we would sort of inevitably have to support multiple of these. So for one, you would want to support both int sixty four and unsigned int sixty four, because sometimes you want something that doesn't fit in the signed range. They're just, they're just use cases for both of them. So if we choose one type that subsumes all the use cases, I mean, because it has all of the integers in it, then this ultimately simplifies both design and user mental model and the implementation. Uh, for use cases that do want overflow, this proposal has some, some functions to explicitly wrap around, which could be useful for, for a few people, but I don't expect it'll be the predominant use case. Uh, and the final thing is that the decision to use big int rather than int64 was actually driven by implementers in the V8 team, uh, Benedict, Moira, and, and Yaro, um, where they, they made this case and they, uh, they claimed that it would really not be much harder to implement big int. Uh, we'll talk, talk more about implementations later. Uh, but ultimately, to get good performance on N64, uh, in a system where you have 64-bit pointers, you can't just store an N64 unbox wherever you want, because there would be no way to distinguish it from another pointer. So we can store, we can store floats, at least in, in most JavaScript implementations, you can store double precision floats unboxed using a technique called man tagging. But this only works because there's a range. There's a range of floating point values that are sort of invalid that you can that you can declare invalid. And within 64, we don't have this luxury because they're all semantically meaningful. Uh, so we would. So because we have no way to tag them, uh, we would have to box them except the cases where the compiler can perform tag inference and put in the optimization paths where it doesn't fit in that range. So the programmer's assumption that. Uh, that in 64 would be faster is not is not necessarily true. So the resolution was we go with begin. Uh, so I mentioned there's been a lot of debate. Uh, TC39 is a is the standards committee for JavaScript, and this is the place that we discuss and debate and re um, refine language features such as begin. 
uh, the committee meets every two months, mostly in the United States and different parts. Uh, and there are representatives from, <coughs> from many different stakeholders in the JavaScript ecosystem, including browser vendors, which do most of the, most of the real implementation work, uh, JavaScript programmers, including people from, from prominent frameworks and libraries that have a perspective on, on what many different programmers would want. We also have uh, some some people who are sort of abstract experts on programming languages who sort of fit into none of those camps. And there's also people from the Node.js community and the core technical community of Node.js. We publish a draft specification continuously at, at this, this website if you want to find out all the details. And the development is on GitHub. So everything is out in the open. It's all through pull requests. Like any other open source project, we have external contributors, which never attend meetings and don't uh, don't really fall into some of the some of the people who are, who are able to attend meetings. Uh, so for this particular feature for Biggins, they've uh, they've been through several iterations. Uh, actually, most of the lifetime of JavaScript, somebody's been proposing to add this feature to JavaScript, but only now is it actually uh, happening to somebody. So it started out in in the first standard version of, e of JavaScript, there were only numbers, and that's the state we're in today. Uh, then in 1999, Valdemar Horvath, uh, which is the, the, you know, the longest time remaining member of the JavaScript Standards Committee, proposed adding several different number types to JavaScript, including, including an arbitrary precision integer type, but also uh, word types and byte types. And this proposal was not taken on. ES2 was a, was a pretty minimal change, and ES3 added some more library features, but nothing as major as new integer types. Uh, meanwhile, ActionScript actually did end up shipping some of this eight years later or so, but not including uh, the arbitrary precision integers. Uh, in ES4, uh, Larger integers and decimal types were again proposed, but the ES4 effort was abandoned. And the decimal proposal, which was part of that, uh, came back in the ES5 cycle, which again became a very minimal cycle. This was actually, decimal was, was really strongly promoted by IBM and they actually voted down the, the final standard, which is really rare in the JavaScript world. Uh, they, they voted against it, but it's still it still passed, everything was all right. But anyway, these, these versions were minimal because ES4 was pushing a lot of things and then nothing happened. And with ES6, there was this, again, a proposal to add value types, a uh, broad set of things which could allow you to do all sorts of calculations with less overhead in theory. Uh, value types might come back, but ES6 added a whole bunch of other things and this proposal was just too big to be included. But then, more recently, uh, some 10 months ago, Brent and I brought back an 864 proposal to the JavaScript Standards Committee. So, uh, a bit about how the Standards Committee works. Uh, there's a stage process involving four stages that each proposal goes through. In stage one, uh, an idea is proposed, and the way that you propose an idea is you make a repository on GitHub, which describes the motivation for the feature and the uh, the general idea, but it uh, really expresses the idea to to get community feedback and interest. In stage two, the committee has oh sorry, stage one also means that you presented it to the committee. In stage two. You've presented it to the committee, and the committee really strongly supports going in this direction, and you have an initial draft of what the what the specification would be. So we use a special markup language called ECMarkup to generate the final specification. Uh, works works pretty well. In the work of Brian Trillson, the editor of uh, In stage three, We've talked extensively in the committee about the proposal, and 
the committee has resolved all of its all of its main problems, but we haven't necessarily prototyped it yet or implemented it. But as far as the abstract language qualities or it being good for programmers, stage three means we've resolved those sorts of things and we've written out full spec text for it. And by stage four, uh, not only do we have this full spec text, but we also have multiple implementations and performance tests. And between stage three and stage four, there, there tend to be some more smaller issues that come up to be refined. Uh, so by the time something gets to stage four, and we have two actual implementations, which which means you know we've shipped it in, in web browsers to real users, or at least we're about to ship it. Uh, this is a real this is a real web standard. It's really part of JavaScript, and it's included in the working draft that's on the website. Uh, there's also a process where annual releases of the specification are cut, but as far as the way that the web operates, the implementations operate, the users operate. This is not this is not the main thing. This is more for some intellectual property concerns. So uh, this stage process was only added in, after ES6. The process for ES6 was really about uh, you know there was this big list of features written down in 2011, and then by 2015 they had written and refined a bunch of spec text. And uh, then it was the standard. And implementation sort of followed after that. There were some things that were prototyped beforehand, but uh, a lot of things only were implemented afterwards. Uh, so the stage process has really helped in terms of making sure that there's a connection between users and implementers and the community. So following this new stage process, we, uh, in Brendan proposed in 64 in November, and it reached stage one. So that, that really kicked things off in a way that it's like, okay, this is, this is really potentially a thing now, and so this is motivated the V8 team to look into this and to propose a, uh, to counter-propose a big end. And at the, in January, we agreed on pursuing big end, where we, you know, all the, <coughs> All of the mainstream browser implementations were in the room, so or delegates from them. So we were actually able to have this conversation about which direction we should go in, how much extra implementation burden it would be, and the implementers agreed that yes, there is this unboxing concern that I was talking about before. It's sort of common between implementations; it's not just something that V8 faces. And at the same time, uh, if we can make it work, then begin to sort of the, the superior thing for <coughs> reusability and for, for long term. So in March, uh, I, I wrote like more expensive spec text based on Brendan's initial N64 and U N64 proposal and there was continued interest from the group so it got to stage two. Uh, we continued to work out spec issues and now it's at this stage three. So at this point, we're really at the we're really at the point where the proposal is solid. It's not changing very much. Uh, you know, just last week we discussed possibly making other changes. Uh, there were some really small refinements, but they weren't they weren't really changes. There was another change that we discussed and decided not to do. And so it's really at the point where people can start implementing it. Uh, you can go to the draft specification, uh, and people have been implementing it. Uh, Robin Templeton uh, from, from Egalia has implemented a, a feature complete draft of, of Big End in SpiderMonkey, which is out for review. Uh, the V8 team is working on Big End, and it's, it's partly done. A lot of the core operations are done. And there's an implementation in Babel that's it's under development. Babel is a Babel is a JavaScript to JavaScript compiler which implements new language features before they're present in browsers. And at the same time, we have conformance tests, which uh, Josh Wolf from Egalia has been working with Robin on, and uh, further browsers have expressed interest. So this seems like it's really a thing that's going to happen. Uh, my prediction is that sometime next year, you'll be able to use this in, in real release versions of web browsers. Uh, 
we'll we'll see what happens. This is this is just my prediction. So, uh, and thanks to thanks to Bloomberg for sponsoring this work, both on the specification and implementations. Uh, does anybody have any any questions? This is the time people want to want to heckle any TC39 members to explain why JavaScript is going in a bad direction. So, any of that would be welcome too. Did you, did you have a slide showing an example of code? How does this thing going to look? Oh, uh, sure. <laughs> I mean, I don't have a slide, but I'll go to the explainer. So whenever you have a specification for TC39, you have multiple documents. Uh, this, is, this is common among web standards, where you have one, one document that describes the motivation, the general shape of the proposal, and these sorts of things, and another document which is this formal spec text. So for most, for most people, the more relevant document is this explainer document. Uh, <clears throat> here I have some code samples. For example, if you want to have a function that that returns the, the nth prime. Uh, so this is a pretty bad implementation of it. But to go from the number version to the begin version, all you do is you, you put ends after the number literals. And begin supports operator overloading, so you can use it just like numbers. Except that if you use them together, then it would, uh, would throw a tight there. So this function, you pass in a begin, and it finds the the end prime. Should I should I make that larger, or is it good how it is? A little bit would be good. Uh, now I can see the numbers. <laughs> oh. <laughs> yeah, they're in they're in red because they're syntax error in JavaScript uh, as of now. Z T mod I that's zero. That's it. I sketched out how it might be integrated into, into Asm.js as well, but I think that's probably unlikely. Probably Asm.js will stay as it is, and, and if you want you know, really high-performance code in an Asm.js-like way, you can use WebAssembly instead. Yeah, so there's, there's a really minimal library that's included in the proposal. There's just parsint, which is like number.parsint, and then these begin dot as u int n and begin dot as int n functions which perform mapping in case you want wraparound arithmetic. Uh, basically you you take the arithmetic operation and you just put it here as the second argument and then it will wrap it. And based on the way that modern JavaScript implementations work, if you hit the you know the higher compiler mode, you will be able to get range inference that will make it so that the, the computations included can be lowered into something that's cheaper. Uh, we did consider adding more functions to the standard library. Like we could add a function that will convert, that will big cast between a big int and a float, uh, or we could add other instructions that might be implemented with with simd, such as pop count or find the the leftmost or rightmost set or cleared bit or things like that. But ultimately, uh, we decided to leave those for for a potential follow-up. And just keep this minimal, just the minimal to have uh, to have begin there. There's also there's also all of the all the operators are included. It's just the arithmetic operators, logical shifts, and and uh, you know bitwise negation. It's it's that's also there. Uh, any more questions? Thank you.